time does not align with that thought, right? Time is a scarcity, right? If we think in terms of time, a man-made construct, by the way, we only have so much time. Oh, I'll be happy, happy when I graduate. I'll be happy when I get my first job. It goes on and on. Guess what? When you attach your happiness to an outcome based on time, that time will never come. You need to, in order to be happy, enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of your potential. That's happiness. Enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. And you've got to know what your potential is. What do you want? You need to consistently, every day, persistently, without quit, enjoy that pursuit. Why consistency? I think consistency is the most important thing. Because consistency elevates your awareness. What's the lesson? Don't limit your point of entry. Consistently, persistently pursue your potential and enjoy it. That's all I did. And so there has to be this point in your life where what you want is so much greater than where you are, you're in such discomfort. In other words, the gap between what you're dreaming of, what you're destined to do, what you're capable of, you're aware of it compared to where you are, that tension between the two has a pull power to it, right? I really believe that, that the end of your life, you're gonna get introduced to the person you could have been, you were destined to be, that he made you to be. And so I'm chasing that dude. Every day I'm chasing that dude. That's the pull power for me. I took the comfortable road. The comfortable road will never lead you to the person you were destined to be, ever in your life. And so I don't, if, you, if you don't become obsessed with chasing that person, you end up never meeting them. Put an unfair pressure on people to have a vision, right? And I think that's true. We're not all Steve Jobs and we don't all have big world-changing visions, to your point. I do believe, however, you can find a vision, right? In other words, it doesn't have to be yours. It can be someone else's. We found Martin Luther King. We found Mahatma Gandhi. We found Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, the visionaries. And people go, I, I love his vision. Right? You don't have to have a vision, but I do believe you have to find one. Some of y'all have a habit of dreaming within your bank account. Some of your thoughts and visions are so big and so outlandish and so powerful and amazing. You'll end up talking yourself out of that dream from saying, I can't afford that. I came here to remind you that when people laugh at your visions and ideas, it's only because they don't have their own visions and ideas around what they're supposed to do with their life or their careers. People that don't have any dreams for themselves, they tend to be dream killers. People that don't have their own visions, they become vision killers. They want nothing more than to talk you out of your own visions. They don't have dreams for themselves. They don't have any hopes. But I want to remind you to continue to dream and dream big. So at any time, if you feel happy or unhappy, miserable, joyful, ecstatic, in a, in a state of agony, doesn't matter what happens, what is your experience, pleasantness or unpleasant? just to know that it's happening from within and it can only happen from within. You can either take external stimuli or you can create your own stimuli, but essentially it happens from within. This one thing, if it is not grasped, when you feel miserable, if you think it's this one, you're gone. It's not going to work. This one basic fundamental thing is something that almost ninety percent of the humanity is always doing it wrong. Whenever they feel miserable, 
it, they think it must be this one or that one or that one or that one. No, all human experience is generated from within. The harder you try, the further away from it you go. First thing is to bring balance. Once there is balance, then you can build a tower on top of this. So many of us are operating on patterns where we're trying to get needs met through other people that we have to focus inward first. We have to be able to fulfill ourselves, meet our own needs authentically before I can then authentically present them to another person. The world doesn't need another perfect person. The world needs you. And you're trying your best. You're doing what you can. And, you know, I think it's really important that you cut yourself a break and that you stop thinking that you have to be perfect. There are going to be days where you feel so underwater, and that's okay. You'll get through it. You'll figure it out. And you've got to understand that it's not about being perfect. It's about just being you. The mind's like, I want to be in charge of you. I don't want you to be in charge of me. So it tells you, let's just stop right here. But once you start breaking through that barrier and start breaking down that governor, the governor that you've put in your mind, because we forget we are in control of our mind. We believe it's the other way around. No, we put in our minds what we should do. We have to reprogram it and tell us, no, 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 we're good. We're good, we got, it's, this sucks, but it's okay. You don't have to necessarily have done anything wrong for things to get completely out of control. It's a terrifying doctrine, but it's not a hopeless doctrine because it still says that there's a way forward, there's a pathway forward, and the pathway forward is to adopt a mode of being that has some nobility so that you can tolerate yourself and perhaps even have some respect for yourself as someone who's capable of standing up in the face of that terrible vulnerability and suffering. Well, certainly by the avoidance of deceit, particularly in language, but also by the adoption of responsibility for the conditions of existence and some attempt on your part to actually rectify them. You know, if you take people and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals, if you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. Success is not rocket science. You go and find the thing that you don't know, learn the thing you don't know, and do the thing you haven't been doing, and get the life you say you want. I just, all I wanted was unfamiliar. But you have to understand that most people don't invite in unfamiliar because people are more committed People are more committed to a familiar discomfort than they are to an unfamiliar new possibility. The key words are familiar and unfamiliar. See, we want to have a new experience while having some of the same behaviors because they're familiar to us. They're, they're familiar. Some of them not even comfortable. People in relationships are not even comfortable. It's just familiar. People are still at jobs that aren't even comfortable. They're just familiar. So that's the craziest that we are more committed to a familiar discomfort than we are to an unfamiliar new possibility because of the familiarity, not even the comfort. To give people a vision of themselves beyond their mental conditioning and their circumstances, to let them know that they have greatness within them. But hon, greatness, it's not our destiny. 
It's a choice that you have to make every day. You have to put yourself in a state of perpetual discomfort in order to manifest your greatness. You've got to reach outside of your comfort zone. So every day I look forward to the opportunity to inspire people to reach higher, to understand and know that what they've done is only a tip of the iceberg of what's possible. Well, I, I think a fair bit of that's probably to be found in, you can find it in shame, you can find it in guilt, you can find it in conscience, you can find it in anger, you can find it in interest and engagement and beauty. There's lots of pathways. If you're angry about something in the world, well, it, it's speaking to you in a moral sense. This shouldn't be that way. Well, maybe you're the person who should do something about it in some manner. Maybe it'll take your whole life to figure out how to do that. Negative emotions can be a pathway to transformation. I'm not trying to romanticize them. They can crush you completely and leave you with nothing, for sure. And they can go badly astray, but shame, that's a good one. What am I ashamed of? Well, can you fix any of that? Because you might ask yourself, let's say you're so ashamed and so crushed that you're nihilistic and you can't see any hope for life. You're just done. You might think, well, what if I was less ashamed? I'm going to work on these things that I'm ashamed of and and just see like does my life improve enough so that I'm not so bitter about it now or I'm not so hopeless about it now and my experience is generally been that that works it works there are winners there are losers and there are people who have not discovered how to win all they need is some help and assistance, just a little support. All they need is some insight or a different strategy or plan of action to make some adjustments that will open up the key to a whole new future for them, that will give them access to the unlimited power that they have within themselves. If we do not do what we cannot do, there's no issue. If we do not do what we can do, we are a disaster. So, I'm saying, at least are you as joyful as you were when you were five years of age? At thirty-five, forty, if you are not as joyful and as exuberant as a five-year-old boy or girl that you were, obviously you are a disaster because you are not even square one. That was square one of your life when nothing was in your control, all right? You're not even in square one, you sunk deeper. That's a disastrous life. Never before in the history of humanity, any generation had these kind of conveniences, these kind of comforts, these kind of wonderful things that we have today. Never before human survival was better organized than it is today. Mm -hmm. If we don't do it now, when? Many great beings have come on this planet, but when they spoke, hardly ten people could hear. Today we can sit here and talk to the entire world. When we have this, if we do not transform the world into a more loving, joyful, exuberant humanity, it simply means we don't care. I don't want to go as that. So it's little tiny adjustments that have the most profound effect on people. And it's never too late to say, I'm enough, I can find love. And now if you give someone the power to make you feel good, you give them the power to make you feel bad. And if you do it to yourself, you feel so much better. It makes you slightly bulletproof. You still need other people, we all need other people. But the dialoguing with yourself and starting with I'm enough,
Are you willing to be inconvenienced for your conviction? And, and as you ramp up, as you ramp up, you're going to have questions. You're going to be afraid. I do more things afraid now than I do fearless. Because the bigger you play, the bigger your breakdowns. Fear fuels you. Fear is informing you. It's not stopping you. I'm not enough. I need more. And if you feel enough, you start to feel equal. See, most of us feel unequal. Really what I'm enough is doing is reactivating, remanifesting, and regenerating what you were born with, an ability to say, I'm enough. The thing that people misunderstand about success is they're looking for the easiest way to get there. When everybody goes five easy steps, 10 steps to greatness, those steps for success, they're infinite. They are infinite. You cannot count them. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. Those steps are constantly shifting. You don't know if they're there Sometimes you have to trust that the next step is going to be there when you can't even see it. And sometimes when you step on that step, you go right into quicksand. And you've got to be able to pull yourself back out of it again. So everybody's looking for these steps, and there are no steps. Those steps never, never end. And you just can't climb steps. Sometimes you've got to crawl up those steps. And you finally get to the top, and everything shifts. It's not about external validation, no. it's about your relationship to yourself. You know, and you know when your head hits the pillow at night and when you wake up in the morning, what that relationship looks like. And if that's missing something, and perhaps that's a little nudge or a call to action that you need to change things up a little bit. It's always gonna be the sticking point. And, and, and a lot of people, like I said, you know, they'll quit moving because it got hard or just because something isn't coming to them right away, they'll let up a little bit. Kobe, he's known for saying something that was quite profound. He said, you have to jumping on what you love, what you do every day. You have to love what you do every day because those days that are hard, those days that suck, that's where the magic is. You go do it and you get your work in anyway because that's where you're gonna find out who you are that's where things are going to continue to happen. And you have to just love putting in the daily work because that's another token in the bank, if you will. You're showing up, you know, striving uh, towards your goal. When people get the challenges, they stop. You know, it's not just going to come to you. There's, but you have to just stick with it. You have, to, you have to really, really believe in what you're doing. And you have to have faith that it's going to work out. But you got to keep putting the work in because if you don't, it's, it's not going to come to you, you know, going to fall in your lap. And, and sometimes when you know that, all right, I'm going through it right now. This is tough. Let's just take an inch forward. Let's go an inch forward today. That'll be a, a better than going backward. You don't want to go back. But I think sometimes just, man, just, just knowing that it's going to be a challenge. I think sometimes that's a, that's a good thing to know. If we know, OK, I want to. This is my goal. Boy, it's going to be a lot of obstacles in there. So let me get in shape. Let me get in shape in my mind and my body to be able to navigate to get to where I need to get to. Well, you come into the world alone and you die alone, my friend. And you've got to be on this journey of growth for yourself. You can't be contingent on another person. And I think a lot of people who are in pain or are looking, you know, for some you know, grounding, often look to that other person. If I date that person, then I'm going to be okay. It's never the case. Like, you've got to be okay with yourself in order to attract that person, you know, into your life to begin with. 
I don't know how you can compel that in somebody. They've got to figure that out for themselves. Thinking of myself as the person who's just good enough to recognize that other people are better, stop doing that. And now start thinking relentlessly about acquiring new skills. That's it. Like, whatever. Be inspired by people that are better than you. Great. That's amazing. But don't sit there and lament, mm -hmm. which is what I used to do, that you're not as good as them. Find out how close can you get. Most times we live a life of have to do. I have to study. I have to work. I have to do this. And I have to do that. I have to, have to, have to, have to. Where did the love to go? We just end up living a life of have to. And I forgot about our own selves. By subscribing to the pressures that come from all fronts in our lives, we've forgotten to live our own lives. We don't have time to unwind. We don't have time to spend with our own selves. We don't have time to be with nature and take a deep breath and just relish the crispness of the air. We don't have the time to do all of that. When the pressures are so high and the pace is so fast, we just don't have time for ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. We are just so existentially in crisis all the time, and I just wonder if this life wasn't meant to be full of love and joy and happiness. I just think we're getting it a little bit wrong. So life is hard. None of us get out of here unscathed. It is hard. I'm not um, a Pollyanna minimalist on the things mm -hmm. that cause us suffering. If you don't fix yourself with limited identities, if you do not compare yourself with anything, if you explore and not... See, if you want this tree to grow to its fullest thing, that's why I said not the fruit, root. If you count the fruits, maybe that tree is bearing more fruit than this one. That's not the point. You nurture the root. The fullest possible nurture if you give to the root, what it has to become, it'll become. A blade of grass cannot become a tree. But is it not wonderful? So, I think success is a funny thing, which is we all seem to pursue it, but we don't know how to measure it or actually how to define it. So how do you pursue something that you can't measure? I think we must all stop measuring promotions, salaries, and these things, but rather measure the momentum of your career. Does my career have momentum? Can I see it moving in the right direction? Can I see it gathering moss? You know, uh, can I see that it's easy, becoming easier for me to keep the momentum? It's becoming easier for me to grow the size of this thing. It's, it's requiring less effort. That's the thing we need to measure. Yeah. That's the thing that we need to be cognizant of, which is the momentum of our career is not just the, the markers that we think define our success. We snap, we react at the drop of a hat just because we're out of balance. People who have a balanced life know how to handle pressure. People whose lives are not balanced sink under pressure. If you are in a dark place and you hear change is real, change is possible, doesn't that lift your mood? Don't you want that to be true? And once you allow it, because you have to allow it, once you allow that to lift your mood, and you're like, I feel better just by thinking I can change. That was huge for me. That was like moment one was when I realized I actually can change. So this thing that feels like a death threat, this like smothering cloud of just like despair, it can clear away. And it immediately, and it's not like, oh, it went from gray skies to blue skies. It wasn't that immediate, but it was it literally immediately a lighter load just because I realized I can change. And people are always looking for how do I have that energy? I'm depressed, I'm down on myself. How do I get the energy to push through? Man, you've got to find a way to find energy in that. You can change. So whatever position you're in right now, you can change no matter what it is, no matter how horrific, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done. Like there is a way out from under it. But part of it is allowing that sense of lightness to be there. This one 
fact would change their life forever. You don't get skills because it looks good on a resume. You get skills because it lets you do the thing you want to do. The stronger the emotion you feel from some outer experience in your life, the more altered you feel, the more the brain freezes the frame and takes a snapshot. Well, now you're freezing a frame in the outer environment. But if you're truly in the present moment and you know exactly what you want, when the heart moves into this kind of rhythm, when you're feeling frustration, when you're feeling impatient, when you're feeling resentment, you are stepping on the gas pedal. The heart is pumping against the closed system and it causes an erratic beat. It becomes incoherent. And energy literally leaves the heart. Now, you no longer believe in your future. You can't put your heart into your future. You can't trust the outcome because there's no energy there. It's, it's being used and consumed somewhere else, so energy is leaving the brain as well. But once energy starts to move into the heart, the heart begins to create a wave of energy right to the brain. And then all of a sudden you see this wave, and the person starts to get a very clear idea. They see their future very clearly, which is the state of creation. This is when you no longer hear the voice in your head that's talking to you that you listen to and believe is the truth. It suppresses the default mode network and the next thing you know, you start seeing in pictures and images, you start dreaming. And that's the imagination, that's the creative state. So now, you start naturally imagining the heart is the creative center. I think one of the biggest challenges with change is too much pressure, especially when someone has other challenges that affect the challenge of distraction. And I would look at small incremental changes. Small changes, but a big priority in their life. The challenge I find is that too many of us are trying to change too many things all at the same time. Small step, big priority. Try and change one small thing, but make it the biggest priority of the week. What we do, we try and make big steps and make them all small priorities. And so we want to shift that, right? Shift it the other way around. To help that person find a small, little baby step that they can take, like children have moments in their life where certain things start evolving for them. That's how we're built, that's how we're wired. So allowing that to happen continuously, even when we grow older, makes it easier for that person as well. We all get to decide what our values are, what our belief system is, what our rules in life are, the code of ethics that we live by. Those are all decisions that people mistake for empirical truth. But if you want to know how just unempirically true it is, look across all societies, they don't share it. The reality is that we're all constructing this belief system, value system, honor code, all of it, and it's going to determine what we do and how we do it. How about I not, how about you not wait to get it right? You look at, you figure out how does it look doing it wrong? <laughs> what are you waiting on? Are you willing to do it afraid? Are you willing to do it knowing that you got so much work to do to get it better, to get it more perfect, but are you willing to do it inside your imperfection? Do you realize that in your imperfection, you're perfect for the job? Here's another great fact. You can change your thoughts anytime you like. And if you change your thinking, it changes your entire life. You have a sophisticated sense of, of the world. You find, for example, that doing things for other people is actually more rewarding than virtually anything else you can do. You know, when you hear, you should be of service to other people. Well, if you actually watch yourself, you pay attention to yourself, and you do something that helps someone else, and it genuinely helps them, I defy you to find another experience that is that satisfying. It's actually quite stunning how satisfying that is. And so that's a very useful thing to realize. When you are talking to yourself, who is talking and who is listening? It's only one of you, but we act like there's two. 
So the one who's talking, that's saying, you're inadequate, you're never going to amount to anything, you're not perfect, you need to wait, it's not the right time, calls this resistance. It's profound, it's deep. It, you know, we, all the problems come from resistance. But who is that voice talking to? It's talking to a voice that wants to be trusted. It's talking to a voice that once said something creative, once did something that was funny, once made something better. All of us have done it at least once. And then along the way, resistance in that voice persuaded us not to trust that self. And if we turn off social media, the only person left to talk to is the self. And if we can adopt a practice and give the self room, it will surprise us. It won't always be right. It won't always be successful. But it will always be better than your hustling, hacking way of just playing with the system. The way you feel about everything is down to two things. The pictures you make in your head and the words. The way you feel about everything, every minute of every day is only down to two things. The pictures you make in your head and the words you say. What have I found that you do about terrible things? Generally, you don't run from them, especially if they're not avoidable in the future. Generally, you stand, confront, decompose, understand, adapt. But just because you generally do that and it's the best bet doesn't mean it's definitely going to work. It's just the best shot you have at it. You know, it'd be lovely if something always worked, but if something always worked, people would never get sick and die. Right, and we do all the time. So we do our best, but that doesn't mean that that always works, but it's still the best that can be done. It's still the alternatives. So, we, we, it's very important for us to have reasons to, like, reasons to be excited about life. Like when you wake up in the morning, it can't just be about problems. Everything that's life must happen to you. Have you come here to avoid life or have you come here to experience life? Experience life, all the different dimensions of what this life holds. What is your compassion for the world? Like, what problem do you want to solve? I often, people will say, there's so many things I can do, there's so many things, I'm like, my question is not what causes you the greatest joy. Since my question is what, is, what causes you the greatest pain? Someone out there who's not living to their potential, and I think we're better people, we're better partners, and we're better parents when we live to our potential. All of us have kind of an identity for ourselves, a way of defining ourselves. And human beings don't usually stray from that. And it's all consistent with the fact that human beings, our strongest drive is the need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. Now that, that's just a story. And if you tell yourself a story long enough, you start to believe it. And once you believe it, you act like it. He said in every situation, between the situation and your response, there's a space. It might only be a, a millisecond. But in that space, you have the ability to choose how you're going to react or respond. When you react, whatever you're reacting to is in control of you, whether it's another person, a condition, or a circumstance. When you respond to the same thing, you stay in control. When perfectionism hinders your ability to have joy, to um, pursue something because of your fear of failure or you're never good enough or you can't relish your accomplishment, it becomes maladaptive. A battlefield that goes on in your mind all the time. And there's bombs that are exploding all the time. Fear, anxiety, I'm not good enough. And a lot of times you're making those bombs explode and or somebody else is making those bombs explode. You have to take control of that space.
to transform your life, you want to do it in two minutes. So is that what your life is worth? So if your life is worthwhile, is it not important that you invest a certain amount of time and energy rather than looking for this stupid stuff of one mantra with which I will transform my life? It will not happen like that. That's the reason why most people have remained the way they have remained, because they've not invested in their well-being. The space between our ears, we don't have control over it. A lot of other people have set shop and they're like, they, they, they've like taken the most expensive real estate in the world. You gotta make sure you control that battlefield that's going on in there. It's your space, it's your mind. You're going to have negative thoughts. You are. Just changing your thought is not going to change your action. It may change your perspective, but you still have to continue to push forward. I don't think that we're born blank slates, but we are so close to that. To worry about where your limits are is to miss how much you can improve. So focus on how much you can improve. There's an amazing quote by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and what he said was, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. To me, it's not about good and evil. To me, it's about malleability. That's a statement of how shapeable we are. Now, here's the terrifying thing about how we get shaped. It happens when you're young. You get all these things that come to you that seem to be simply true. I believed that the human mind couldn't change. I believed that it was fixed. I believed that my talent and intelligence were just what they were. And one of my favorite quotes of all time is from Albert Einstein. And he said, the most important decision any human being has to make is whether they live in a friendly or a hostile universe. Decision. The most important decision anyone has to make. Because neither of those two states is empirically true, but either will immediately appear true once you decide to believe it. So once you decide to believe, yo, the world is working for me, this is happening for me, it's not happening to me. Once you believe that, you start looking for the ways in which that was powerful. How is the worst thing that ever happened to me actually secretly the best thing that's ever happened to me? You could be one of any countless identities that we see in the world. But we don't, because each of these places carries with it a value system, a belief system things that are unique to that group that you grow up in, what your parents tell you about your family, about you, what it means to be you, what you learn in schools, what you see in the media, all of that stuff is shaping how you view yourself and how you view the world. But it's happening insidiously because it is so invisible. People don't realize that they are choices. Now, once you reframe all of this, these are things that I'm choosing to believe. And once you realize that you can choose to believe something new and thusly get a different result, everything changes. They have that story of, of just depression, that, that story of you know, where you, know, you stop believing in yourself and you suck and you're just not good, where it can bring you to your knees. That's part of the process. I mean, that's part of you coming face to face with who you really are. What are you going to do about it now? And I think from there, that's how you learn. At least that created a, a real hunger for me to go out and actually study the great ones. You know, study the people that have had great success because it leaves clues. Because the formula for success is there. But we all have these stories that you can, I'll come in here and I can tell you my story. There's underlying, like there's always, stories of jealousy, the stories of, okay, I'm not good enough, the stories of, 
I don't have what it takes, uh, and, you, and the self-doubt, and all that, and envy, and all that stuff, wrapped up in different stories. But I think that we live in an age when our lives are regularly punctuated by career crises, by moments when what we thought we knew about our lives, about our careers, comes into contact with a threatening sort of reality. It's perhaps easier now uh, than ever before to make a good living. It's perhaps harder than ever before to stay calm, to be free of anxiety. Because the moment you identify yourself with something, your intellect's work is just to protect that identity. If you… whatever the identities of nation, or family, or gender, or race, religion, whatever, the moment you identify yourself with something, your intellect will only function around that to protect that. So, it is a certain type of prejudice the moment you're identified. So, the only thing I did with my life is, I never identified myself with anything, and life just exploded within me in ways that thought seems so puny that I do not indulge in thought most of the time. You matter. Most people don't believe they matter, that they're worth it. And they're worth it very much. They matter very much. There's a reason why they're here. And we all go through different challenges and obstacles in our life. And they're natural. I mean, we need to face these challenges. They're here to teach us something about ourselves and why we're here. So listen to the challenges, listen to the obstacles, don't run away from them. And focus every day on how you can improve just a little bit of your life so you can feel better and make someone else better around you. I think it's about refusing to have someone define you and to say, I'm not going to be silent. I have to maintain my authenticity because it is in how we give our voice, allow, give ourselves permission to speak our truth. That's what's going to change our world and the world around us. I always thought that confidence was a thing that you feel. And I have come to prefer that confidence is something that you do. Meaning that, you know, a, a lot of people to, to think, okay, well, you're going to feel confident first. And then once you feel confident, then you'll take the action. And that's wrong. It's not a chicken or an egg in my mind. I think what happens is you have to force yourself in a moment of self-doubt to do something. And when you see yourself taking action, the confidence follows. So I have created my own definition of confidence, which is confidence is the willingness to try. And you display the willingness to try when you take action. It's a lot like the relationship between courage and fear. You can't have courage without fear. Courage isn't the absence of fear, it's acting in the face of it. And confidence isn't the absence of self-doubt, it's being willing to try even though you doubt yourself. But what the hell is success? It's hitting an expectation. And I always tell people, man, trade your expectations for appreciation, and it's a whole new world instantly. Yeah. If you can appreciate this moment, if you can't find ecstasy in this moment, in a conversation with a friend, and looking in your wife's eyes, being with your children, going on a run, a if you can't find ecstasy now, I'm here to tell you, more money, more people, more love, more business, more anything is not gonna give you more ecstasy. You got, if you can't do it here now, you're not gonna do it there when you got more. So why not do it now and, and have a rich life right now? I tell people, money, that's one thing. Like having financial abundance, there's skills, that's a science. But wealth, it's a decision. 
to recognize the gifts in you, the talents in you. Because sometimes we, we numb those talents because we are always afraid, because we want to listen to what others say about us. But it's important to dig deep within you. Come home to yourself. When you do come home to yourself, then you own who you are and you own your voice. Focus in on our ideas and make sure that we own them, that we are truly the authors of our own ambitions, because it's bad enough not getting what you want. But it's even worse to have an idea of what it is you want and find out at the end of the journey that it isn't in fact what you wanted all along. shapes you long term. Your model of the world is the filter. That's what's shaping us. So for me, the first step is just opening yourself up to new experiences and new role models. Because most of us can't see ourselves in people, so then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. That sets a pattern for for what it means to be an adult. I think what it means to be an adult is to be in touch with the child that you once were.